I think we're live. I think we are. Yeah. <laughs> well, here we are. Um, I'm really, um, I'm honored to have a friend like you that, that I can discuss um, story and scripting and the business with. Um, it, it's always a pleasure to have you, Script Doctor, here with me. This is the first time I've tried a stream um, with a guest. So uh, you are the guinea pig. <laughs> I am honored to be the experiment. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, uh, as you see in the description there, um, I wanted to, I wanted to, as part of our evolution of, as we've been writing together, we were talking about, you know, genres that we love and things. And I want to find out your thoughts initially. Um, the movie Double Indemnity ended up being one that you and I both love. And yes. it's part of a genre called film noir. What's your thought on film noir? My, my, my hypothesis is it's one of the few sort of uniquely, um, uniquely post-war uh, American genres that can talk truthfully about people. But I'd love to know what your take is on film noir and how you think Double Indemnity fits in it. Um, my take on film noir has been it's kind of like a romantic tragedy. Hmm. Um, because I, I, I don't often, when I think of film noir, it's very rare that I can think of a film noir uh, movie that ends on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> by its nature, yeah. Yeah, because by its nature, and, and there's so many, so many interesting things that I, I admire about it. I especially like the fact that the protagonist is usually someone of uh, dicey reputation, and it's mm -hmm. only when they actually kind of do something honest. It's when, when they actually suffer. Yes, and I noticed. Did you notice too that that the evil characters often tell the truth a lot more than the good people do? That the the narrator the narrator tends to be unreliable, don't they? Uh, yeah, because uh, it's Walter Neff, and at least in this one, um, yeah, and he's doing his confession, and it's like we're not one hundred percent sure if he is telling the exact truth or not. Because yes, because uh, he's covering a very long time frame, like several months, yeah. Um, and anyone who's at least of uh, who doesn't have an eidetic memory, and that's a lot <laughs> of people, uh, tend to get some things uh, misplaced here. But the other part of film noir that I really enjoyed is the fact that it t it takes the concept of um, of a victim and weaponizes it against those that have insecurities that want to fill a role that they're not comfortable filling. And in this case, it would, it's usually like the heroic rescuer, the savior, the, the shining knight type of thing. I love um, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it's it paints a picture of humanity as corrupt and evil, that there's a certain self-serving, greedy, like, you know, the old saying, you can't cheat an honest man. Mm -hmm. Well, Walter Neff, uh, who is brilliantly played by Fred McMurray, I thought, really against type, don't you? Oh, um, God, yeah. Yeah, he um, uses that sort of every man approach. You know, that, that was why I cast myself in Trouble is My Business, is that I'm kind of just a every man schlub who, um, <laughs> you know, is, is driven, has a desire for money and sex and power, you know, and Wal Walter Huff, the character that, that Fred McMurray plays is, is he's a insurance salesman, but he's driven by those same desires. You're absolutely right. And, and his confession is self-serving, but it's also that has that kind of drenched in inevitability, which I love in film noir. Don't you? Oh God. Yes. I, I mean, it, it, like, the first film noir ish type that I saw before would be Sunset Boulevard. And uh, it, this kind of has the same thing. It's like, oh, the, we're introduced our main character in the last moments of their life and they're recounting the story of how they got here. And what's so fascinating about it is that the way that they set up the narrative of the story, you kind of forget that this is them dying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I want to welcome Brett Cohen with the $5 super sticker. Thank you so much. You are the first. I wish I had a drum roll. <laughs> Thank you for joining the discussion. Yeah. I, you know, script, I, you bring up a, a great point overall. I think film noir also had... You know, you have to be as luxurious a, a country as America to really go that dark and be able to really examine um, the sort of underbelly of human nature. And I think film noir does it really well and very honestly sometimes. And um, women in it are very powerful. Like I, oh, often yeah. I think some of the best parts are women in film noir because they not only um, use their feminine power, but often they are um, very much uh, symbolic of uh, a sort of uh, 
rejiggering, if you will, of the the sexual politics that happened after World War II, that there was a certain concern, you know, women were in the workplace, women were being um, uh, asserting asking themselves. Yeah. yeah, asking for more, and, and often um, uh, the duplicitous nature of uh, females in film noir, there's usually the good girl and the bad girl, uh, and I think that worked a lot of uh, masculine fears about um, you know what what were women going to be? Could it, femininity corrupted and turned into this sort of evil um, manipulative character? Like uh, obviously, like our character in Double Indemnity, she she um, uses her sexual wiles. You remember the the opening? Barbara Stanwyck played. Uh, I think her name is, is Phyllis, right? Phyllis. Yes, Dietrichson? Phyllis. Yeah, Dietrichson. Yeah. And, and we're introduced to her by, you know, that descending the stairs. And it's from, you know, his point of view. And you see the ankle bracelet. And, of course, the ankle, the bared leg being very much symbolic of a, a open sexuality. Well, she really is in the driver's seat in that. And he is very much um, being manipulated. But what the film is saying is that even a, a man who posits himself as a decent man could be corrupted. Isn't That's an interesting story point. It is, and I, I'll, I'll go a bit further into that. So when we first meet her, she's wearing nothing but a beach towel because she's sunbathing out on the roof. And then I think it's when she gets prepared, like dressed and comes down, she's got the anklet on. And what's interesting is that um, – so when a woman wears a bracelet, it usually is on the, the same hand of uh, – as or same arm as the ring finger. So the left mm -hmm. hand so it draws you to the wedding ring. But when you put it on your on your ankle, it draws you to the legs. And then as you work your way up, it's like, well, you're – you're seeing all this other parts of the woman before you acknowledge the fact that she's married. And that's where you get the signal of uh, she's kind of, you know, she, she's um, willing to, to forget that, that little piece of jewelry <laughs> on her, on her ring finger. <laughs> it's negotiable. Yeah. Negotiable. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it seems like she, it seems to her like she was doing her own thing. And then as soon as Neff comes in and she's just wearing the towel, she's like, I've got this guy hook, line and sinker. And it's a great example of what I love about film noir as well, especially for the femme fatale is that they're playing like 4d chess in a very long game. Yes. Well put, well put. I almost feel like, uh, you've tapped into the visual, you know, you and I are, are people that love words, but there's also a visual script, a visual language, which film noir really brought into sharp focus because you even have white clothes on the anti-heroine. You know, yep. she is she is presented, um, when I was doing Trouble Is My Business, I wanted the, the dark-haired girl who appears to be the bad one, you know, dark, dressed in black, but... You know, the good girl is the blonde and she's light and she dr I literally dress her in white, you know, and, and I think I think we respond to that as human beings on a primal level because, you know, it's the white hat, dark hat we're supposed to. But it's contrasted in this because there's the brightness of Southern California. Remember how he would pull up to the house and it's everything's brightly lit. Uh, it, you think of film noir always being at night or whatever, but I think it can be really effective when you have occasional brightness. Uh, and contrast, you can explore this darkness because sometimes the evil is hiding in plain sight. Yeah, exactly. It's basically because when you're hiding in plain sight, you're among everyone else. And that's where the camouflage kind of comes in. It's like you, all you have to do is just kind of look to your left or right and then mimic that. And you have made mastered your disguise, so to speak, where if you're trying to hide, you know, somewhere where people aren't looking, you're obviously not supposed to be there because people don't normally look there. And that's why you're kind of like front and center and, and yeah. you're exposed, so to speak, because it's like, well, this is an out of place, out of character uh, situation. And, and that's what I really liked about this genre and specifically about this film, because I mean, I remember in film school, mm -hmm. uh, so many people were saying like, well, film noir is just black and white. It's like, well, no, <laughs> the opposite. Uh, it's a genre yes. of many other layers and details black and white was basically because it was cheaper to film it like that <laughs> that's right that's right uh, um, color stock was so much more expensive and also remember uh film noir was a response to economic pressure you didn't have mgm musical money where you could build a million dollar set and light the thing so they used negative space and darkness or just a blank wall and a shadow to evoke things and it became a strength they they pulled that from uh, influences in Germany and Kurosuro lighting and expressionism, and it actually made it uh, a lot more rich and lush. And the and yeah, and traditional theater as well for simple sets, uh, things yep. of that nature, where they play around the lighting. And it really is kind of a cinematographer's dominant skill set of film noir because yes. they're able to do a lot. 
like they can channel the director's narrative uh, like approach but it's but it's film noir allows the cinematographer to play a lot more with with the light and the the frame in ways that you wouldn't need to in any other genre although you definitely could and obviously spruce up another genre with those techniques yes but and we've seen it cross over into some of our favorite films you and i were talking about it's like you know blade runner obviously the tech noir look of terminator uh there's a lot of great films that have taken that aesthetic and and one thing that stuck in my mind you might like is billy wilder was the director of this and he was a guy he's a writer he's also a director and he could do almost any genre he did it really well yeah. but his dp i believe his name was john seats i think but I what think he called yeah, he, he called it textures of light, yes. is what he called the thing. And I thought, what a great term. I, I hadn't heard that before. Textures of light, that to bring the psychology out, the camera was using light, and you would have slow pans and intense close-ups, and the compositions could tilt or go off balance. But it was all in service of the words, the snappy dialogue, the, 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 the plot was all served by these textures of light. I thought... What a great Not only that, even the crossfades. Like, I mean, yes. uh, we're jumping a little bit ahead in the movie, but it's a great yeah. example where um, uh, where Walter Neff is in his apartment and then Phyllis comes in uh, right. after their first meeting and they kind of embrace. And then we cut to, you know, current time where Walter's, you know, talking about uh, the plan that they were, he was thinking of to try and pull this, this scheme off. And when we cut back to his apartment, they're on opposite sides of the sofa. She's a like replacing makeup and he's like having a cigarette and you know exactly what they did there, but they <laughs> yes. got away with it because it's all about the subtleties of the blocking. The light is a lot softer. Lighting is a lot mm -hmm. softer in the room. So it's yep. more like kind of like, um, uh, after like you have that, um, uh, like that after the adrenaline has calmed down and you kind of have like that shroud of dizziness yes. and disorientation. You kind exactly. of get focused again. Yes, after they intensely, you know, obviously made love, they there's that kind of refractory period and just off balance. And it's like that was like a point of no return. That was a tipping point as a story point because then he was in all the way, and uh, she literally. Knew she in had the him. Yeah, yeah, she <laughs> knew she had him, and um, I, I, you're right. I, I, I think with the limitations and this is something else we've talked about is with limitations like certainly of the day with censorship or whatever you had to find creative workarounds and that's not a bad thing hey oh brightest day for hey. yeah. <laughs> brightest days here all right cool. right we got people to care or not in. hello well welcome we're talking about uh, one of our favorite films double indemnity let, let us know if you've seen uh, if you've seen the film jump right in and thank you james pond <laughs> no time to cry. I love it. And Troy. Troy Pacelli. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, we're, I'm having a great discussion with Script here about uh, Double Indemnity, just to bring you up to speed. And we were talking about, um, I would think it's one of, I, I, I believe it's one of the very first film noirs. And, and film noir really grew out of a phrase that was a dark film or, or shadows and night scenes. And you think of the rain-soaked streets that mark the genre. And we were talking about how light or, you know, Billy Wilder, the director as DP called it textures of light, how that serves the story. Um, yeah. Yes. It's, it's a, it's an incredible classic Troy. Um, it actually, now, now uh, you're a fan of the pulps. It did a double indemnity started. It's a James N. Kane novella. Was it part of a pulp? I don't know. I think it, I might have been published in a pulp magazine. Okay, I believe um, it was I a know serial. That Raymond, yeah, maybe it's a serial, uh, but I do know that Raymond Chandler hated the dialogue, in it. <laughs> um, and I and I, I don't believe it because I think Kane was kind of considered like good at concept but ta terrible on execution. Mm, interesting. Uh, and that's just going off of memory because I I, I read mostly like. If I'm going to read like old style stuff, I'll read Walter B. Gibson. I'll read Ray, Raymond Chandler. I'll read. Uh, I'm a huge Ross McDonald fan. Yeah, right? in fact, uh, a little in bit fact, of Ross McDonald. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lou McDonald, uh, the partner in Trouble is My Business, is named after Lou Archer, a character that Ross McDonald uh, wrote a whole bunch of some of my favorite pulp uh, hard boiled books. So his, his name is a combination of Lou Archer and Ross McDonald. Um, uh, so it's a little nod to my favorite author. I, I, I think with, with Double Indemnity, too, I think not only did it play really interestingly with the idea of uh, an anti-hero and an anti-heroine and we had talked about her introduction visually you know and the white mm -hmm. and the necklace and the sexuality but but i think it also kind of uh 
it, it, it looked it was a way for a, like a light comedy actor to play against type. Fred McMurray was amazing in it, proving yes. that even a nice guy can commit murder, which is such a which is such a film noir theme. He, he in reality he was a nice guy and he was a nice he had all that baggage you know that you bring to a a film, but put him as the fast talking insurance salesman and he could be corrupted. And I think that's that's something that the noir genre is trying to say is that we have to be careful that even even the best of people uh, are there's an underbelly to human nature don't you think that that that's sort of what it tapped into in a deep vein why it's still relevant it, it is because again it's like an exploitation of our own vulnerabilities and what i really liked about this film is the fact that gene heather who plays the daughter um she's kind of like uh the angel that reminds neff of who he actually is because she's She's kind of like walking the line. She's got that boyfriend who kind of doesn't really treat her all too great and mm -hmm. her, her dad doesn't like him. But he's like – but she's waiting in his car. She's like, maybe you can give me a ride downtown. And he's thinking, okay, fine. And then as he talks with her, he learns that, yeah, she's she's trying to cope with her own situation. She doesn't like her stepmother. She, um, and I think that's not – I think it's after that scene where we, we learn a bit more about the situation. But yeah. when he does drop her off and the, the boyfriend is immediately jealous – because mm -hmm. you can tell from that action that he knows he doesn't deserve this this wonderful young woman. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and Walter Neff is like just treating her like a kid and uh, as he should, he's like looking out for her a little bit. And then when we move a little bit later where you know the policy's being claimed and they can't and uh, they might be being watched, he's actually interacting a lot with that daughter and just kind of like being a father figure to her, to her and he's questioning himself like what is he doing <laughs> yes exactly. and it's like she's the hope that he has but he's like he's already been tempted and you know committed to uh her stepmother but at the same time he's like he wants to look out for this girl because her her, her father has been murdered he killed her father that's right and, that's and she right. has nobody to, to to trust and he's still that good guy deep down um and he's i think he's like partly is he trying to convince himself that he's still the good guy or is he trying mm -hmm. to do this because of, out of guilt and it or is he trying to get information to to sway or uh, throw off his his supervisor, played by the amazing Edward G. Robinson, who just yeah. steals the movie? Oh, he's <laughs> I, great. He's he's a stalwart as a as a character actor. He was in so many good film noir. Uh, James Pond points out the earliest noir was yeah one of my favorites, Maltese Falcon, nineteen forty one. Yep. Um, yeah, Edward. He was such a great um, either leading man or character actor. He was utterly believable. You never caught him at acting. You just went, no, that guy. That's how he is. That's just yeah. him doing doing him. I, I I I'm I'm so blown away by what a good actor he is that I wonder what he was like in real life. I wonder was he like that at all, or was this just the most brilliant act over decades where you you just don't know um, the real him because he's so believable in the roles that he has. And, and he's one of those guys who could play almost anything, uh, evil, good, uh, middle management. Uh, <laughs> he, could, he could be a detective. He could be a put-upon uh, guy having a middle-age crisis. You know, he was able to do anything. And, and I think his, his experience ha made him handle, and you can speak to this as a writer, the long speeches they gave him as a character. He handled them the way you would handle Shakespeare. He makes them sound natural he handles them so expertly but if you watch it again watch how good he is with the words when he's talking to him he has really long speeches as keys that was his character yes. and 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 i feel like he was someone that a writer could trust you know he he was the, he was playing the uh, he was the insurance company claims manager sort of, which is he sort was, of a detective right he's he is a, a claims detective. manager he he signs yeah. off on real claims and fake and basically knocks off fake claims and i think it comes back to something that i learned this from Louis Bomander who is an acting coach in in Canada who taught Eric McCormick and Keanu Reeves and a slew of others mm -hmm. um and he was just like you just have to be fully committed so yeah. first you have to be committed to the lines second you have to understand the lines and then on top of that, you have to understand the concept between action and behavior. So, yes. like, and with with um, with Edward G. Uh, Robinson, it was basically it's like this guy just made sure he knew why the character spoke this way or were saying these specific words. Yes, and he just threw himself into it. And I mean, his famous speech, one that I 
I've tried to memorize. It's really difficult to, but it's like um, he's talking to Norton, the, his boss, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, you in the front office. Come on now. You've never read an actual <laughs> table in your life, have you? <laughs> Why, you've got 10 volumes on suicide loans, suicide by race, by color, by occupation, by sex, by seasons of the year, by time of day, <laughs> suicide, how committed, by poison, by firearms, by drowning, by elites, suicide by poison, uh, subdivided by types of poison, such as corrosive, irritant, systemic, gaseous, narcotic, uh, alkaloid, protein, and so forth. And it just goes on, and he just rambles it off like he's it's an expert beautiful. because yeah. he is. Because he is. He means it. He means it. And he, and he does lives it in it. one shot, too. And that's like, the, yeah. that's the, the clincher because, I mean, I can. That's I can, the thing. So that, many things now where a monologue is broken up with like reverse shots and everything else. So yeah. Get it. Oh, it, he just he just owns the screen, and that's the thing. Even the people in the chat, if you if you take another look at Double Indemnity, something that's missing from a lot of movies now. Certainly, there are indie movies, and there's certainly some movies that have incredible dialogue, incredible stuff. But if you look at a movie like Double Indemnity, the love of words, the snappy dialogue. And what it says about the characters, that is for grown-ups. And that is something that cannot be lost. It's film is a visual media, and nothing's more visual than film noir. But the reason these films are classic is not only do you have that beautiful look and that stylized way that it's shot and told, but you also have a love of words and words revealing character. And, and if you heard script just now, I mean, just think of all of that just dense dialogue that just effortlessly flowed off of them. And some of the best roles um, for women, particularly Barbara Stanwyck, that was probably her best role was Phyllis Dietrichson. She, you know, I would say she's a wife who has a husband she'd rather not have. <laughs> yeah, well, and, well, yeah. Know, husband she sought after and then realized uh, the mistake she made, and then on top of that. She makes that role work given how terrible the wig they put her in. <laughs> yes, she does. With the fake bangs and everything, and she just—it just, it just she makes just, it work. <laughs> she's a classic femme fatale, and 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 that, you know, that role, that particular, um, you know, ironic sort of contrast to the way she presents herself. Uh, you know, the the blonde with the white uh, uh, clothes. The wig, I thought, made her look kind of sleazy and the sweater. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think her entrance in the towel, just it really pushed the uh, buttons, you know, of male energy, female energy, the masculine and the feminine, and some of the, our deepest fears about women using us or being bad for us. Um, the way she kind of descended the the staircase in that opening was her descending into his life, and they have this sexy dialogue that has all the, you know, Billy Wilder always put double meanings and things to try and get past production code, but all of it was working together to uh, let her hint at the possibility without actually saying it. Uh, she wanted someone to murder her husband, and when he refuses her, he's like, "Hey, I think he says like the hook's too strong," yeah. <laughs> and then she shows up again. And, and, you know, when, and after they make love, he says, okay, we're going to do it, but we're going to do it right, which is, you know, it's got to be perfect. And with that phrase, he's linked up to the plot right there, you know, like that, that right there links the two of them together. And I just think that's just a tribute to um, how much character story and plot can be together. Cause there's a difference between story plot. Uh, it, 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 there's a definite delineation though. And when they all work together, that's when you get something where it's working on so many levels. You, you, you have to look at it a couple times and go, what did they do to make this? How did I get here so fast? Why, why am I, in, why am I all in on the murder of this poor guy? Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that I, I, uh, I like a lot about uh, the pulp genres um, and film noir is that on the surface, it feels like it's plot driven, but it's actually quite character driven. The plot is just so simple that mm -hmm. because their motivations are so strong with that goal, it carries themselves away because they always dig themselves deeper into a, a hole. Because again, when you're doing like the motivations in film noir, are never for honorable reasons. And you're kind of looking more at the prize and not the process to get there. And Walter yes. Neff is trying his best throughout this entire film to look at the, at the course to get to the prize. But he, he, he screws up with like three key elements. Yeah. And uh, those key elements are number one, the insurance policy for the husband that, didn't that signed it under false pretenses <laughs> yes um, yes and as a result when he got injured he didn't make a claim so that's your first red flag the mm -hmm. second one is that um 
he he tripped over his crutches uh, and fell off a, a train at 15 miles an hour. So how did he die of that? How did he die? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't clean. It wasn't perfect. Yeah. And then uh, what was the third aspect? Uh, there's a th- uh, hmm. Crap, it'll occur I, to you. Yeah, it'll occur. It'll occur to me later. But those are the first two that are your red flags that he didn't that Walter Neff didn't account for. He's like, well. You know, if he if he broke his leg and he, he you know he had this insurance, he should have filed a claim. Like, why wouldn't that's he right. file a claim? And it's like, oh crap, he, that's a mistake. He didn't think about that. He didn't realize that it was. That's yeah. right. It's like a nightmare, isn't it? It's it's, yeah. it's film noir taps into almost a nightmare state where you're like, once the the tumblers start going, one domino falls off. And it's like, wait, we didn't do that right. Now I'm going to get caught, but I can't get out, and this person is going to kill me now if I bur- if I try and get away from them. And now I'm getting in deeper and deeper and deeper. And and it, you you say this sometimes, and and, and it, you know I encourage people to look at your service. Uh, you're terrific as a script doctor, and and in analyzing scripts, I encourage anybody that's thinking about writing to uh, to hire you to to take a look at at their scripts and break it down because you always say this and and Double Indemnity is a perfect example, simple plot, complex characters. Yes. Absolutely, because this is the one thing I love the the best about this is like after we get into that second act where he's like we I Neff's like I planned it all out. This is how it works for double indemnity. So instead of a fifty thousand dollar claim, you get a hundred thousand dollars, and all mm-hmm. he has to do is has to be on a train. <laughs> like it can't be in the normal workplace where the the possibility is already there. It has to be outside of it. Um, and I think I think also within that time it probably could have. I think he probably could have also worked if his car broke down and he got into an accident that way. It might have also been double indemnity <laughs> plus car insurance. So he yeah, would have been true. like almost triple. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> triple indemnity is the sequel. Yeah. 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 Well, but, and that's um, the thing. Yeah. And it was all about just manipulating him to get on that train. So like we knew it one step at a time. The first one is get him on the train. Yes. And then once we get that arranged, it's like, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to kill him before he gets on the train. I'm going to get on the train pretending to be him. Then I'm going to jump off the train and we throw the body on the tracks. And it's easy <laughs> to follow because it's just basically, okay, we kill him first. We put myself on the train to pose as him. We throw the body, we ditch the body so that it can be found. We're home free. And you think it's very simple, easy to follow. And then once we get, you know, uh, he's involved in this, at first he just says, yep, okay, this is uh, an accidental death. We'll pay it out. And then as uh, the owner gets involved, he's like, no, I think it's suicide. And he's like, there's no way it's suicide. Back to that little brief part of the monologue I, I spoke earlier. And then that's when he starts thinking more. Yes. Because if, if the owner did not bring it up as a possibility for suicide, I think it would have been – they would have been scot-free. But because yes. he, he gave – he pretty much pumped the brakes on Keys. Keys is like now he gets the time to think. And that's right. Going into it, and he's like, "Yeah, all these things don't add up." He thinks it's murder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they gift uh, Keys with such a great thing in the writing, where he has a sensitive stomach. You remember that? Yes. He has an eagle eye and a sensitive stomach. Because I think his character was his first name Barton. It was Barton. It was Keys. Barton Keys, and he Barton never Keys. carried matches because it would always explode in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> See, I love, I love stuff like that, like little grace notes like that in a script and a character are fantastic. And yes, once he um, once he gets his teeth into something, he never lets go. Like it, yes, you know, it's like a terrier. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah. What is it? Uh, Neff says, uh, I'm trying to remember the line. I'll probably mess it up, but it's a wolf on a phony claim. Yes, you know, <laughs> you know, and 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 I think that's that's um, a, a great distillation through dialogue of who they are. And and just think about this: the 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 film itself uh, is timeless because even though the the situations, you know, the cars, the things might change, human nature doesn't. You can still take this idea and you can look at People magazine and there's someone somewhere who's working some angle that gets pulled into this whole dark sort of noir um, underbelly of human nature and they get in deeper and deeper and deeper and they can't get out. And there's something about Double Indemnity as a cautionary tale. Uh, you know, he, he's an anti-hero, but but he could still be you or I in the wrong set of circumstances. We, you know, when I'm talking about film noir, I often pitch it as uh, we all have a friend who's heading for a brick wall and we keep saying, <laughs> don't do it. She's bad. She's bad for you. That's a bad idea. And they go and they hit it anyway. And, and I think this movie, if you, if you know, you were on a deserted Island and you and I wanted to show somebody like, what, 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 what do you mean by that? Like, what, what do you mean by film noir and say, you know what, let's watch double indemnity because, uh, not only is it a you know dark film, but it's about ambition and lust and and guilt, or I would even say mistrust, wouldn't you? It seems like the inner life yeah. of the characters are built on 
on the kind of mirroring of the darkness of the of the way it's lit, they mistrust each other, and and the psychology is brought out. I I don't know. Was it was it written with his usual writing partner? Was it uh, Diamond that he wrote this with? I don't. Uh, no, I think it was. Um, I think it was primarily. Uh, Billy Wilder, Billy Wilder, mm -hmm. and Raymond Chandler did the screenplay, and they oh. both like butted heads all the time with it. I think Diamond was um, working oh, on something else, right? Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember. Uh, was he? Uh, hold, hold on, I can pull that up. But yeah, he has this other writer that he does. I think he Diamond was with um, uh, in old Chicago, maybe. Oh, okay, okay. Well, can you imagine though? Even if they butt heads, you've got Raymond Chandler writing dialogue first, with yeah. you. <laughs> Which it's it was his first screenplay. Yeah. Um, and what the other part too is, um, and I remember, uh, gosh, I, I think I, I told a writing uh, student of this years ago when um, we see Barton Keyes' introductory, introductory scene. And it feels well, like at first glance, you think it's a superfluous scene just to introduce this character and dish out exposition, but it's actually mm -hmm. setting up who Barton Keyes is and how the insurance um, yes. claims work out because you have this guy who. Um, he, he set his truck on fire to get the claim so that he could either buy a new truck or whatever. Right. And he's is like, no, um, I'm denying this and I'm going to call you out on it. And I'm doing this so I can teach you a lesson not to try and pull this crap again, because I want to make sure that you are an honest man, because again, we are going to maintain our, our business relationship in the future. Once you get a new truck, we will recover you again because we know you're not going to do this. And he, that entire um, setup is Barton keys t showing us how this guy is actually he is a good hearted person because he, he could have arrest sent him to the police and got him arrested for fraud. <laughs> yes. Like, no, just sign this paper to, to refute your claim and mm -hmm. you're an honest man again and you're good to go. And there's no problems anymore. And you know, you can still be a client of ours and all that type of stuff. And it's like other people in his position would be, would be first, we're going to deny your claim. Then we're going to report you to the police because you're trying to commit fraud. And then, you know, now you're really screwed <laughs> as opposed to this guy's <laughs> like, you made a mistake. This is how it's going to work. I know it was a faulty claim. I know exactly how it is. I know we sent investigators out. They found, you know, butane or whatever it was um, in there. And it's it's setting you all up on the things that Walter Neff has to start thinking about when he proposes the, the plot of getting getting yes. rid of Mr. Diedrichson. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and it's all relationship. And the reason that Neff is brought in there is because what we find out later is that Keyes wants to – hire and promote him as a uh, claims uh, that's right guy. that's right ironically yeah and, and he's just kind of like you know wetting his beak at it so to speak and, and neff has no idea that's going to be the case right like because he's brought in there he doesn't do anything he's just there to observe <laughs> and it's like well, why is he there but it's a nice little setup that gets paid off later later when he's like listen you're you're too good to be a salesman you know all your policies you yep. are the, yeah. one of the few guys i trust and i want you to work beside me in this thing and Neff is like i'm a salesman i don't i don't do that stuff i i have my own plans my own things yeah. i want to do he, he's almost fatherly which makes the disappointment harder isn't it because yeah. he, he kind of takes him under his wing so the betrayal is not just professional but personal i think it's like 11 years like uh yeah. Neff has been there and then he's been 17 or something of that nature yeah yeah so and it's, like a, the, it's a personal betrayal it's a personal yeah. betrayal it's a personal relationship and it's one where even by the end when keys shows up <laughs> because uh, the janitor <laughs> says, yeah, I, Walter came in and I saw some blood <laughs> and, and keys is like, I have to get back to this. <laughs> to the office." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and yep. It's hard right. to do. Well, we're writers. So, you know, it's hard to do an exposition dump like that at the beginning to explain, you have to explain, you know, the rules of the, of the universe or what the thing's going to be about, like what double indemnity is. But I always call it, um, the Pope swimming in the swimming pool to distract you from the fact he's doing a, an entire exposition dump. You need to find something interesting and organic going on so that you can explain and, and, and in other words, set the table uh, in an organic way because that information is necessary, but it's dry. It's hard to put an emotion to a definition of, of double indemnity. And I thought this did really well. When, when you approach uh, exposition, are there little tricks you like to use? Um, yeah, but primarily I want to make sure that if I have to explain something, I have to justify why the character is saying it and I have to make mm. sure the character that is speaking that exposition is saying it to someone who by all accounts should have no idea of what yeah. is about to be, be said. Like for instance, as we we're just talking about this, there's that little monologue I wrote for, uh, the character that you'd be playing in one of the scripts that we're writing where mm. he's like, 
I didn't want a murder. I was trying to like, you know, I was trying to um, build up a family, not start a war like that little monologue. there. Yes. That is me trying to channel like, you know, classic film noir style yes. uh, dialogue there. Yeah, I felt that when and, and that you, you captured that really well in that my character was revealing himself in the dialogue and you were moving you were moving everything forward, which, you know, everything has to move the story forward. But what you did really elegantly in that line for my character was you also set the table of these are the these are the lines. These are the rules. This is what his internal life is feeling right now because people don't tend to just go I'm feeling really scared right now you know they, they <laughs> usually talk around it and yeah. and and you're good at that as a writer one of the reasons I really enjoy our collaboration now is you make it naturalistic but it still needs to and this is important for anyone who wants to write it still needs to serve the story it still needs to re to reveal character or it shouldn't be in the script because you, knowing what to leave out of the script is as important as as what you put in the script yeah and the other part too is i angled that conversation to be trying to appeal to empathy to the other character who he's dragged into the situation he doesn't know why he's here he sees it it's a horrible thing and he's basically saying yes i know this is a horrible thing this is not what i wanted but in order for me to make sure that I, the outcome that i want succeeds i need you to do this yes and it's basically <laughs> the negotiation and that's the other part too with exposition you can do a lot as long as you're appeasing to what one character wants and what one character doesn't know or what that other character wants as well and you just have to make it kind of natural. Like the worst thing you can do is, and I, I point to like maybe say, say you're in a military situation. Like a general is not going to tell another general something that that general already knows. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. if they do, they're doing it to serve the audience, not serve the character. Right. What that general should be doing is telling it to a private. Like yes. he just got out of base. He's like, listen, this is the battle plan. This is why we're doing it. You're going to be on the front line and you might die. Yeah, but that's, uh, that, what, I'm going to tell you so what true. you're dying for. <laughs> yeah, that is so true, and it drives me crazy in modern movies where literally the team is deploying at the location, and they go, "Okay, here's what we're going to do," and they, <laughs> they break down what the plan is literally while they're hopping out of the back of a van or rappelling down something. I'm like, shouldn't we have talked about this before? You know. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, you're right. You're right. It needs to be either to someone who wouldn't know, or at least in an appropriate time in it or or do time shifting you know um double indemnity does something that you know christopher nolan would be proud of and that um uh, it 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 effortlessly moves around in time you know we, we start with a guy with crutches mm -hmm. uh we we move backwards into a confession uh to keys uh, uh talking about you know what he's done almost in retrospect and um i think if you can if you can definitely move the plot along so that you show the audience different things they need or want to know, even out of order, you can even play with that traditional act structure. You don't necessarily have to have the beginning be the beginning or the ending be the ending, but that requires even more discipline, you know, and that's something, you know, if someone came to us with a script or something, we would look at and say, look, if you're going to get fancy and start flipping between times and do all this, it has to be even more airtight, wouldn't you think? Absolutely, because, again, the beginning of the story is, is always going to be the beginning of how it's introduced to the audience. So it's definitely not always going to be the beginning of that character's adventure. Um, right. And that's why whenever I see something where it opens up, say, like in Double Indemnity, it opens up with his confession and then it does a time jump yes. back. Yes, it's done a bit more organically because it's also a bit more natural because we know the outcome at this point and now we're just following up it's like how we got here where right. then you take something different like more modern like say for instance Sonic the Hedgehog where we're at the start of the climax where he's running away from Mr. Robotnik and what have you and then it pauses in a freeze frame and says now let me tell you how I got here yeah, like, let okay, me, here's how I got is, here yeah. this is not exactly as organic as Double Indemnity <laughs> because you, you basically yeah. just try to pique our attention with a with a very cheap hook and now you're going to give us a bunch of boring stuff until we get to that point where in this one here what makes it more interesting is that we're set up with some mystery uh yes neff is injured he's bleeding out he goes into um an office and he starts making a recording it's like well, why is he making a recording well probably because that injury is worse than it actually is that that's actually right. looks and yes. then he just and then he's uh delivering this speech to clearly a very good friend and a trustworthy friend Mm -hmm. And he's saying like, maybe this is a confession, but maybe I'm just just give you all the, the things out. And he just says like, you got you checked all three boxes. Was it suicide? No. Was it accident? No. Was it murder? 
you bet. <laughs> and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. Boom. I love that. That's so, so hard boiled. And so yeah. it's the present itself is what is the hook. And now it's like, okay, now, now I've got the hook in this actual action. It's a mystery. And I don't know all the finer details. I do know the, the premise of it. Now you have basically asked for and earned permission to start from the beginning. Yeah. And, and, and it starts off strong. It's basically saying, I've been trying to get this Mr. Diedrichson to renew his policy before it expires. Uh, and I finally, you know, I went to his house because he wasn't picking up his phone or what have you. I meet the cleaning lady. And then the first woman I see is his wife naked, but wearing nothing but a towel. And it's like, I'm going to stay here for a while. And you come, you're already on board <laughs> and, and everything just kind of spirals and escalates from there. And I love the fact that at the start, he, t he calls her Mrs. Diedrichson. And then as soon as they have their night to together, he just keeps calling her baby. And the way he says it is just so silly because it doesn't feel natural because <laughs> it, it's just like Walter Neff's like, yeah, come on, baby. You just got to keep it still. Keep it cool. Don't, don't lose your head. Just, you know, whisper, don't speak too loudly, baby. And it's just like, it just feels off. But I, it's just kind of feels also at the same time, like Neff's never been in this position before. True. Where he's, where, and he just doesn't know how to say it. And he's like, if I, I, I'm worried that if I say your name, it maybe someone of Keys, Keys uh, spies will listen in and see that I'm actually talking to you. Maybe that's what he's doing it for. Yeah. We, we don't know, but it's just, it feels so odd. Yeah. Um, it but really at the same does. Time, all the other dialogue is great. It's like the innuendo that's thrown in there, um, the, the the casualness, the way he struts into a room, like tosses his hat on the chair and just keeps going without <laughs> missing a beat. And <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's cool. It's just he's a cool character when he needs to be, and 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 it goes to you know his confession in the beginning goes to that thing we were talking about earlier, which is the unreliable narrator or the reliable narrator. You're you're not sure if you're being told the truth. Um, I, a confession I have to make is the, the reason um, my film, uh, Trouble is My Business, actually opens with a guy pulling up. He's been shot in the arm. You can kind of, if you look closely, you see a bandage that's bleeding. That's mm -hmm. the only real-time part of the uh, of the movie. Everything else is flashbacks within flashbacks. And he's injured. And w one of the reasons I have the line be, uh, take me to the cemetery, she's still alive, which you know, <laughs> that those two lines don't belong together. But also, uh, it sets the stage very much like uh, Double Indemnity did, you know, even better because because it's a classic double indemnity set the stage that he was acknowledging the sort of father son relationship was corrupted between him and keys, you know, character the older man that, that trusted him and looked at him as a son. He let that woman come between them and it eroded that trust. And he had to confess to him what he did wrong knowing that he was probably going to die, knowing that he was going to break the old man's heart. You know, he, he said, you know, I love you to, to him. And in the confession, he's like, I, I really did too, you old crab. You know, he <laughs> says to him and, and, and this woman kind of interceded and used him. And that's a primal male fear is that, you know, this, this powerful sexual woman comes in and corrupts or uses you and you think you're getting one thing and you're not. Um, and, and I, I feel like, the flashback aspect of it just played perfectly into the inevitable, into uh, the sort of fatalistic thing that would take over film noir. But remember, this is one of the absolute first. You know, we had this and we had Maltese Falcon and, and even more than Maltese Falcon, which, would, you know, again, the ending of Maltese Falcon was fantastic because it was the thing that dreams were made of. It was all about nothing mm -hmm. um, and people destroying each other. This was... Some, seeing someone's dream of a happy life and of, of getting away with murder, seeing that destroyed and, and, and seeing that murder scheme sort of uh, uh, peel open like an onion and reveal the, the rotten heart of it. And, and, and I find that fascinating. Uh, I also think of it as like a very clever warning sign, which is um, don't let the superficial fuel your desires. Mm -hmm. Um because that's all it is because they're all like – they're thinking more about the fantasy of like, yes, we'll be happy together. We'll have $100,000. We'll be away from it all. It's like – but that's just on the surface. There's, there's there's nothing about personality being exchanged between these two. It's all lust and on and, and physical and and financial. It's all the things that don't really matter overall with, with life, especially when you contrast this genre with an actual romance where it yes. starts off superficial and then there's the depth found and then it's – then there's something, some sort of wrench thrown in between the relationship and both sides. Both parties are doing everything they can to fight for it for survival because there's yes. something real there. Where in this one here, any type of obstacles thrown in, it's really just um, 
about the money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And yeah, and there is no family. There is no real love. You had the love of a father for his son in that, you know, Keys had that feeling for Neff. Yep. Uh, and and he rep wants repentance. You know, he's repenting to him. But the only family they had was each other. Uh, there was no, no, um, there was an absence of family, which Billy Wilder, I think, kind of played into that the, you know, partners in crime, they met at the supermarket. Do you remember the scene they met in the supermarket? And there's a, a, a Neff is, I think there's baby food or something. He goes, can you reach that package of baby food? Oh, and, yeah, for and, the woman, and, yeah. And he calls Phyllis, the woman, baby, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's like, and, and so at, at the heart of it, it was kind of like a twisting around of, you know, traditional family. It was a tra a, a, of the traditional roles of all of that. And film noir kind of turned it all on its head and, and exposed the underbelly of it, but there, the, uh, to me, the the very key of it was the the themes of sex and money getting entangled and identity shifting and changing. Uh, you, you know, he was the good you know good man, quote unquote, who was the salesman who gets shifted into a murderer. She was the discontent housewife who actually just was playing all these guys for what she wanted. And and then you at the at its core, you had the one person who. Uh, kind of look for the truth even it, even if it destroyed him which was keys who was kind of the father figure to him and and you know why does he confess to keys at all that's a, an interesting question you know i think that's answered by the fact that um so keys is talking to to neff in one scene where uh he learns that neff has got a girl and, yeah. and um he doesn't know who it is and he doesn't trust trust the girl that he's dating even though he's never met her or heard any, anything about her Right. And what he ends up saying is he talks about how he got engaged once and he, and he was all about the love and everything. And, but there's that little voice inside that said, you know what? I better do a background check on her. And he does. Mm -hmm. he finds all this stuff on here. That was just a nightmare. It would have made his life terrible. It made right. it together. And so he did the hardest thing, which he had to do, which ended it. And it shows you that for a relationship, it wasn't about just the superficial. It was about the long term, And that was him trying to give a warning to Neff. It's like, listen, you, you're with this dame. You're, that you know is giving you all everything that you want out of a relationship or so you think but it's not what's going to sustain you yeah and it's sort of like a very subtle message saying like listen if you're going to be with a woman who's willing to kill her husband for a few thousand dollars what do you think she's going to do to you if she can get more <laughs> exactly yeah, exactly you're going to be next and she literally confesses she's totally rotten and never loved it yeah, you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing. I, if I were approaching writing this, I guess, I guess you and I would just map it out. Almost, we'd have to look at it mathematically, wouldn't we? I think so. Yeah, it would just be like pacing. Um, all the like, overlapping, yeah, all the overlapping flash flashbacks, flashback two, and having it all intersect. And then, if I were if I were writing it, I, I wonder if I wouldn't write backwards sometimes from the end. I would probably write it in a weird format. Uh, the first one being <laughs> kind of like the journal of the femme fatale, like ah, okay. what her situation is, how she got there and what she wants out of it. And then thinking, okay, of, of, from that, who is the best archetype or best person in best financial position would have you that would be most susceptible to what her plan would be. And then yep. you would figure who that guy is and then work out his life. And then try and figure out, well, how did these two people meet? And then what do we know about the, the woman that I've written? What do we know about the guy that I've written? How would they meet? And, and how would she be able to present her her victimhood to him mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to seduce him into you know compromising his own his own perfectly happy life <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, for a shot at, uh, at this type of woman who who, who is in the situation? And I would, and then I would work it from there, where I would basically say, okay, this is her plan. Her plan is, I'm going to kill my husband, and I'm going to get someone else to plan it for me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that's that's because that's essentially what it, what it is in Double Indemnity. Is like she doesn't know how to do it, and she doesn't know want her hands dirty in it at, at right. all. She's just going to manipulate somebody to do it. And I would probably work from that aspect. And then once I would figure out, okay, so once I figure out who the who the guy who the victim is going to be, which is in this case the man, the man is the victim in film noir. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, he um, is. And the woman is being the antagonist. Yeah, you, I would just kind of work from from that as my background motivation for their plot. Um, so I would have to, I just have to figure out, okay, what does the guy want, and how does that bring it to her, and then how much far can I take his want, 
until um, he's with her uh, long enough to forget of that initial want and just want what she wants. Yeah. And then that's where it kind of like goes off the rails, so to speak, like for his, from his perspective, it goes off the rails and onto her track. And now he's just kind of whisked away. And from there, it's just focusing on the cause and effect aspects of it. But even, but even from that part, like my methodology would be getting that first draft down, then reverse engineering it, like re outlining it from there and then start picking into the parts where you can have fun with um, the back and forth between the femme fatale and our hero and, and the mentor figure, if, if there's one there or like the best friend and then all the social dynamics around that. And then just kind of like re outline it again. Once that outline is kind of reset, then you hit mm -hmm. go back to draft and then you just pull all the favorite stuff that you remember from that first draft <laughs> and weave it through until you get something nice and solid. It's because again, yeah. it, it, screenwriting is really complicated. And I, I've said this on other streams. I've said it on Twitter. It's like, it's the one part of entertainment where everybody thinks they can do it until they start <laughs> yeah that is so true and and a, and a script you know as somebody who directs film and and loves to write one of the reasons i love writing with you is you think about structure you think about character and things myself i often start also with images um mm -hmm. things that um uh, I might look at uh, the film establishing like the downfall of the the character from that opening scene, that first 20 seconds and form the theme and the insight. So I, you know, if I were outlining the script, I would be like oh, opening image, you know, th uh, that states the theme. And I would think visually about that. Or, you know, we see road workers at the beginning with, with uh, lanterns and, and they're guiding traffic. Well, that's that's saying avoid danger you know <laughs> the card goes by and ignores a stoplight you know it's it's that's the film the opening image if you get i encourage everybody go look at double indemnity the opening minute of the film a car zooms past a stoplight yeah. <laughs> and ignores the warning size of danger and then that 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 danger is repeated throughout the film with the constant sort of uh, uh, him avoiding this warning, this red flag, this red flag. Um, so much, you know, that even, uh, you know, even if you look at it from a, a standpoint of, you know, was the femme fatale dangerous or did she even cause the destruction or did the character internally do it? All of that to me breaks down to scenes. I can hear dialogue and imagery. So, so something like, uh, Double Indemnity uh, deserves revisiting. If you can find it on Blu-ray or, or find it online, watch it again because you look at the, the archetypes, the dark sides of our personality. It's it's a relevant film. It's not an old movie. It's it's not a, a good-for-you film because it's, it's considered a classic. The reason it's classic is because like a really good book or uh, uh, any other work of art that still speaks to you, it's the animalistic side of our impulses. And, yeah, it's and, actually um, it's it's a great warning message because uh, for anyone that's like twelve years old, if you're ever listening to this, watch it because it'll save you a lot of grief <laughs> in high school, uh, <laughs> just because of the social structures that are in in, in high school, which is actually so true. something that's in there. Like, there's popular, there's hierarchies and popularity, and that like, is true. You know, people fill in certain roles like sometimes it's um president of student council sometimes it's a cheerleader sometimes it's a sport a athlete sometimes it's a, a dramatic artist sometimes it's a um. I don't know the hall monitors like mm -hmm. it's all over the place in various <laughs> different roles and positions of it um but it all kind of plays into it because what's interesting about neff and it this is what i really liked as the fact that he's a, a salesperson but specifically for insurance is that right. his fatal flaw is his own arrogance yes but, and, and he self-sabotages there's yeah. nothing more arrogant than a salesperson <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is true and and he self-sabotages uh yep. with that you know you, the, the downfall of your own ego is is very big and something to look for in that film because you have to keep that in check that that his arrogance he thinks he's above it all he thinks he can get away with it but fate is always there to, to there is always a reckoning there always has to be something paid um no matter how elaborate the plot or how simple they think you know a simple murder is you're gonna get caught in this world and and i thought uh, you know, Wilder really caught that in the film and, and certainly, you know, the, the original source material, I'm sure, had it as well. I, I did look it up and it was an eight part serial by James M. Cain in Liberty Magazine. Oh, and, nice. uh, yeah. So, so again, the pulps, uh, I, I think you and I need to write something that's a, that's a pulp, like a pure pulp, uh, whether it's sci fi or hard boiled or some combination of it, because the pulps were such a great, 
uh, rich sort of training ground for great stories and really edgy stuff, but also just great genre stuff. And and this film, you know, grew right out of it. It, it was a novella that became uh, a classic film. And and I, I have to speak to uh, the music as well. Oh, yeah. It's such great. It's, it's, it's Miklos Rosa, I believe, right? Rosa? Yeah, it was uh... Rosa. I believe it was. And and um, it, it, it had that kind of... Uh, strings and lush sound, but also used some dissonance and and was all very important to that mood. You have snappy dialogue, witty dialogue with these double entendres, and on top of it all, it's musical. You know, when, when, when we're doing dialogue, it feels musical. Like when we read it back to each other, you, you know how it feels right. You're like, no, that's a beat there. <laughs> you would say this and you would stop. Well, that that's music, and, and that's the same feel that you would have um, writing a piece of music you have with dialogue. It just feels right. It, it has the beats right. Um, and, and in the case of this film, the, the music really served it well because uh, it just underscores it beautifully and, and is iconic. He's, he was a great composer. And in this case, uh, you don't hear much said about the soundtrack to this film. But one of the reasons this film is so good is the sound, the use of sound in this film is extraordinary you know and it's overlapping dialogue and and it's uh music and just the the use of silence and quiet is also good because they had to get around censors you can't show a murder you know you can't do these things so everything had to be implied so pushing against censorship uh challenged the artist towards in my in my opinion some greatness you know oh, that yeah that, like that um that little like kind of crescendo they do when neff comes from the back seat and strangles that's uh, what i mean exactly it, like yeah. it, it's done and it's we don't see it i think we hold on um this is uh phyllis Dederson there that's correct uh, while it's happening and the fact that she has no emotion yes or no makes it even more chilling is, yeah. oh it's so chilling you don't you don't get off in like scenes of that that nature anymore no, they, they would just show the murder. Yeah, they would just show the murder. <laughs> yeah. They would they would ruin your imagination as a result of it because it just it, it's uh, like an overstimulation, so to speak. It's like oh, yes, yeah, so we become numb human. to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then at the same time, like they do that. Uh, he does the like the the music kind of like the high pitch type of um, like the the build up to it, and then like the dramatic like waning of of like you know the horns and the strings. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then I think he does that again. When he's on the phone with uh, with Phyllis and she's like, "Can I come over?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure. Just make mm -hmm. sure nobody sees you." And then, <laughs> as soon as he hangs up the phone, his there's a knock on his door. Knock on the door. Keys, and yeah. now you're like, "Oh my God, it's a ticking clock." <laughs> like, the <laughs> yes. best thing ever. He's like, he's got to get him out of there before she shows up because I if know. He shows up, it's done. It's and so beautifully. Yeah, you know, beautiful. you know, she's on her way, and they have him knock on the door the minute he hangs up. Yeah, because yeah, he's like, he's freak. He's like, well, that was quick. And then moments, <laughs> not um, the same height, but not the same body. <laughs> yeah, but not the same body. Yeah. Um, Again, so the snappy getting, dialogue. I love snappy dialogue. Like I that. love I, the snappy dialogue, especially what Keys does in here. But the other part too, and they, and this is something that I don't think that this is something that threw me off because again, I've lived in apartment buildings and doors don't open outward. Mm, and and mm -hmm. the only reason that scene works is because he opens the door outward and she hides behind it as. As Keys is like saying his goodbye and then taking the elevator. That's a good Normally point. Normally the door would be opening inside the apartment, so she'd have nowhere to hide unless he lived like kind of at a corner hallway and she was like mm -hmm. around the corner. But I know why they, they did that is because they, they had, had a shot yeah. in an actual like a, a really quickly built set. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they needed the set to do that, uh, you know, as a conceit. Uh, that's one of those times where as a filmmaker, you're like, look, I need her to be behind this thing. I, I know the physics are wrong, but let's make this work. But let's make I, this work. And yeah. but, the, but the thing is, that scene is played out so perfectly for suspense. Yes. Because there's literally only inches between these two characters that shouldn't, uh, like, one yeah. of them should not, should know that the other one is not supposed to be there. Exactly. And it, it's all time point. And then Neff kind of picks up on that and, and sort of, like, senses her, probably smells her perfume. The fact yeah. that Keys doesn't, I think, has to do with the fact that he's smoking a cigar. <laughs> yeah, he's got his cigar, and he's he's not looking for something. He, he actually let something. his guard down because he trusts him. And trusting someone is a negative in film noir. It's yes. a weakness. Um, and you're absolutely right about the sound. The, the murder, you it's taboo to show it in detail. So, you know, Neff is in the back seat, and I think uh, he's breaking Dietrichson's neck or something. I'm or like alert. it's asphyxiated yeah. at least, yeah. Yeah, and, and they point the camera not at... Dietrichson or Neff, but they point at her driving and she smirks. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that acting is great because, again, you were talking about the three themes. I think the three themes of the movie come out in that transport, you know, going somewhere, train, mm -hmm. doing all that, the evil of women and <laughs> se sex and the body. It yeah. touches on all the things that they're saying that 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 woman uh, is temptation is evil, uh, the body you know the murder, but it's all embodied in that kind of smirk that she hears her hated husband die, you know, and that and that pushing against that censorship made Wilder create a masterpiece because he had limitations that he was working in, and if you look at uh, Double Indemnity now, it still resonates even though it's uh, you know a movie. Um, what is that, 80 years old, more than 80 years old? Oh, 90, um, almost, no, yeah, almost 90 years 41. Old. So, yeah. uh, what is it, 41 or 45? I, I think it was 45. I think. Yes, 40, uh, 45. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, sorry, 44. So, yeah, it's still almost, you know, 80-ish years old. Yeah, probably... and, and it's still incredibly relevant because it's so well-made, but it's uh, ultimately it's about humans. It's about people. And I, I, I think the best films are like that. You know, if you if you look at a science fiction film, or if you look at a, a great detective film, or or any any genre film, even a, a romantic drama, like it's, it's exactly about the people. Yeah, we want exactly. them to get together, type of thing. You want them to get together, and most importantly, it's about people. Like if you if you watch a trailer and the first minute of it is all things like a boat and a building and a thing, you know you're in trouble because a movie is supposed to be about people and faces and and the human experience you can have it set against a canvas of an incredible world and all these other things but you have to feel something and and you said it best suspense most movies don't ever build suspense about something you're handed it or it's um it's foreshadowed so far in advance that they've taken all the air out of it you have to build tension anticipation uh even in comedy even in 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 a love scene there's that rubber band of tension that pulling back and forth that we don't know what where it's going to go what to expect it you don't want to break that tension until the right moment and then the release is almost like in horror it's the jump it's the scare yeah. in comedy the release is a laugh so in in a weird way, and in you know, film yeah, noir, the release is a sigh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's an almost resigned sigh of yeah. You know what? It can happen. It, it yep. could happen to me. I, I, you've got to. You think you're above it all, but you could get caught up in this web and go. How did I end up here? And also, you can look and you can see in your neighbor this ideal situation and well, what a great life they have and mine isn't, but underneath it all, it might all be corrupt. There might've been so many compromises made to have them superficially, you know, it's like the Instagram effect. It's like the Instagram picture is the highlight reel of everyone's life. And you go, <laughs> Oh my God, you went to Jamaica, you did this or that, but what compromises <laughs> did that person make the other 364 days to end up there? Yeah. And, and so I feel like Double Indemnity is a film that any anybody that loves just the human experience, that loves cinema, that loves writing, good writing, filmmaking, or just is a person who loves a great story, Double Indemnity is something you should seek out, revisit. Unfortunately, a lot of streaming services don't have it because it's in black and white. I went through this fight myself with my own film because it was black and white people wouldn't put it on the streaming service but find it physical media rent it find it because double indemnity uh um, it, it has might a, be a classic movies too so it, it might be but you know you have to look for it and when it when it might be available i um i encourage this, everybody because this is out. a this is a paramount film from like the golden days of paramount yeah paramount um, used to do amazing stuff <laughs> they did used to do amazing up until uh ago, about a decade ago they used to do amazing stuff yes they did other than the mission impossible films they really don't have much going on there and it's a shame yeah. but um, um, and, and i wanted to go back a little bit more to that that scene in the car where yeah. um phyllis uh, just has that smirk because everything that happens up to that point so barbara stanwick is playing the exact same type of well, she's weaponizing the game that uh, her stepdaughter is doing, that uh, Lola, uh, Jean right. Heather is doing. Because everything that Jean Heather is doing with Walter Neff is pure honesty. Like, she doesn't want anything out of him. She's she's just saying, like, these are some of my issues. I need someone to talk to. I need someone to listen to me. I'm not manipulating you. But she's, she's going through the same type of emotions that Phyllis is actually just emulating but not really experiencing. And she's added in that, that temptation of sex to Walter Neff in order to mm -hmm. get what she wants, 
where Lola's just innocent. She doesn't even care about that type of stuff. She's like, Mr. Neff, you're just a nice man who helped my father and, you know, did all this stuff and was looking out for our family as an insurance adjuster. (laughs) (laughs) So ironic. Um, and, And she's so innocent to him to the point where even when you find out that I guess her boyfriend is kind of also being manipulated by, uh, Phyllis as well. Mm-hmm. Um, when they confront her, like Neff's saying, like, you know, Lola's a good girl. She, she doesn't like, you don't deserve her and you know, you don't deserve her, but I'm giving you a chance where you can save your hide right now and leave <laughs> and, and not go and see Phyllis. And you can go, you know, give her a call and be the man that she wants you to be. And it, it, he, it's funny because He's so aware of Lola, but at the same time, he's not 100% quite aware of what Phyllis is doing, even though the game is – they're both playing like the same game, but one is playing it to manipulate. The other one is playing it just for empathy. Right. And, and it, it just shows this great dichotomy of like what should Walter Neff be really be focusing on? Well, you know, he's wrong, this, this young, innocent girl. He should probably be responsible for that, but instead is he's just being so easily – well, I don't know if it's so easily, but he's being um, definitely sed- seduced and manipulated uh-huh. by, by this woman because it's not just the temptation of sex. It's a temptation of like ease. Like it, there's no difficulty in their future if they have $100,000 and they're just together. It's like they just live. Um, and that's it, so temptation the, – the easiest path is always the most, one of, is the most, most uh, tempting one. That's and, true. and I like the fact that Lola on herself, she's not looking for an easy path. She's she's trying to reconcile with with her ex boyfriend, even though she kind of like dumped him and stuff. And she's trying to figure things out now that she's an orphan, mm-hmm. and she has no idea what her future is going to be like. And now she's stay. I think she's staying in this like this woman's um like apartment, like where where she's got like yeah. a like, dead mother that's taking care of her to a degree. Right. Until she finds a man to marry and you know be the wife, right. Um, and it, it, it's so strange to, just to see, like, you know, she's got her place, but she's looking ahead for what her future could be without any idea of what that goal is. She just has ideas and things that she wants to pursue. And then Phyllis, on the other hand, is like, I want my husband dead. I want the stepdaughter out of my life. And I want 100 grand with Walter Neff. <laughs> That's right. And Which, it's like, by it's the so way, 100 specific. grand back then is about, what, a million three now, a million four? It's, a, it's, least, a, it's not a small chunk of change. Yeah. Well, yeah, like they're saying, like the house that she was living in is like, what, $30,000? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In <laughs> Glendale. This, yeah. In Glendale is this beautiful, like, um, uh, Spanish mansion on yep. the hill. <laughs> That's where I first lived when I moved out here. I moved to Glendale. I was above uh, Glen Oaks there, and there there are some beautiful houses up there. I, I I swear I've driven past a house that looked exactly like that one. But it's still yeah. there. It's still standing. Oh, oh I'm sure. I'm sure yeah. it is. Um, I saw some film footage uh, someone used for rear projection. You know, which is when you're driving, and literally they shot my street in 19. 19- 47 i think it was there's some footage of my you go right by my house uh in 1947 it's pretty amazing and it's amazing how similar the street looks just every everything's smaller the trees are smaller and everything but very little's changed and and in all that time because um just the style of the houses and everything they just they caught it beautifully in uh in double indemnity i think that's one of the things i noticed when i when i first went out to um to la is because i i got i rented like this little um, place in uh, Century City, <laughs> and mm-hmm. it was like this. It was, and it was not a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> but because um, uh, I was, I was making ne- networking there. I was making friends, and they're all like living in like these various like out, not really outskirts, but, like little little suburb pockets throughout uh, around uh, Los Angeles. And one of the things that's kind of funny is I noticed, oh, the houses don't really look like they've been changed or renovated mm-hmm. or like they've been somewhat maintained, but not a whole yeah. lot. And I think that has to do with the fact that it's all industry people. They're so busy getting productions made. They don't care right. so much about They don't have time. time. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, my house is like uh, 1938. Uh, yeah, it's that It's that look. Um, the, the, a lot of the houses have not changed. They're, they still kept the original uh, facade or the exterior of it. Um, so it, it's, for me, it's interesting. I always love seeing films set in L.A. from that period because you can kind of go, I know that that road or I know that place or I know where they are. And it's always fun when they actually go on location, in, yeah. in, uh, particularly in film noir from that period because you can kind of see what uh, things look like and they're still somewhat recognizable, which is kind of cool. And I also think because of the, the stable weather, like there's, you don't get a lot of thunderstorms. You don't get like, you don't get True. water damage on the exterior of the, of the homes as frequently as you would everywhere else. 
So you don't really have to worry about that type of thing. So think you can still have, I mean, I think I saw one, one home. Oh, it must've been in Burb. No, can't have been Burbank, but outside of Burbank where the owner said like, it's never been painted since the first time it was built on the outside. <laughs> and there's only like a little bit of chips here and there from like sun damage and fading, but like, there's nothing else wrong with it. Wow. It's like, like, <laughs> why it's like eh, it doesn't rain it does like you know wh what's gonna what happens out here it's like it's the same 78 degrees every day <laughs> that's right yeah you could just uh put the same as steve martin does that in a film where he does he pre-records the weather broadcast like months in advance it's yeah. gonna be sunny again today yeah you know? <laughs> that's yeah, so I got true. three options of what it is and i just play the one <laughs> as it happens <laughs> That's so true. Well, I, I, I want to wrap up this discussion with a couple of uh, interesting little uh, facts about it. But also, yes. I encourage everybody to uh, please hit like, please subscribe to the channel. Um, uh, Script Doctor and I are going to have more conversations like this if, if he's available. Um, we'll try and do this on a little bit more regular basis. Leave some suggestions, some movies that you'd like us to talk about. Yeah. Or if you have any questions about writing or would like to uh, get some writing advice, uh, Script Doctor has a great business doing that. Um, I am looking at doing some more films. I have a film out right now called Trouble Is My Business, uh, which is a film noir. And uh, I'm looking to do a slate of films next year as we uh, emerge from all the difficulties we've been having over the last year. It looks like we'll be able to start producing things. So please hit like and subscribe. Um, and do check out, if you can find Double Indemnity, it's one of our favorite films. Uh, you will learn about life, but you'll also, as someone who... Uh, enjoys film like i do this is pure cinema it's uh it's amazing i one thing we were talking about what a great part walter neff was well you know no one wanted to play walter neff the main character um a, a fact about it is after the project got through the production code and uh through a, a fairly i would say laborious screenwriting process as you were saying uh ian chandler <laughs> didn't get get along um a big snag was that everybody turned down the leading man, the insurance salesman, uh, Walter Neff. Uh, he went to, um, I'm going to try and remember. I know it was Alan Ladd, um, George Raft, a few other people. And uh, Raft asked him, well, where's the lapel moment? And uh, <laughs> the lapel moment would be where Neff, you know, would flip over his lapel and reveal a badge and everything would be okay. <laughs> You know, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, Wilder was like, um, "There's no lapel moment," and so Raph's like, "Well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not, do not going to be a bad guy." Wait, he's uh, actually a sleaze mall. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And thank you, Brett. Thank you for your comment. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed our chat. But yeah, he didn't want to he didn't want to play a, a sleazeball. But then Wilder went to Fred McMurray, who was known for doing lighter, you know, comedies. And yep. and McMurray, I think uh, his reaction was like, well, I do comedy. Why would you want it? And he's like, that's exactly why. And ultimately, you know, even McMurray said that Neff was one of his greatest roles. And uh, I can't imagine anybody else but him doing it because he brings that that everyman quality, but also also, uh, the baggage of being the good guy and seeing him corrupted like this. Um, I think also Barbara Stanwyck was scared to play Phyllis Dietrichson. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, just as a final kind of fact, is that um, there was a lot of difficulty. At the time, she was a really... I, she, Barbara Stanwyck may have been the highest paid actress in Hollywood at that time. I'm not sure 1940s, but she was up there. She was definitely up there. So to play a seductress and, and murderous, um, you know, she was a, a serious actor and, and had Oscar nominations. And the idea of playing a dark role like that, I think, was intimidating to her. And um, Wilder, I remember a quote Wilder said to her, well, are you a mouse or an actress? Oh, yeah. <laughs> And she's like, wait a minute. So she took the role, and uh, I think she got a – did she get a Best Actress nomination? She, pro I think she might have uh, playing that incredible femme fatale in that. But it, it's kind of interesting that both both uh, parts were really hard to uh, uh, to cast. So it was – it was uh, um, a lot of movies are made um, in allowing for happy accidents and also by sheer force of will. Um, it, it, I know for a fact, you know, it takes me years to get something made and it's like, uh, waging a small war, moving, uh, all the people I call putting in all the people around the hole and pushing them in the hole at the same time. Pretty much. Uh, yeah. That, that is exactly how it is. So this was actually nominated for seven Oscar, a uh, seven, seven Academy Awards, but lost all of them to uh, Billy Wilder's rival, uh, who, whose name is, I forget at the moment, but, um, 
was it Leo Leo McCary? I think was so. It, yeah, I, I think he was a rival. Um, we did much lighter fare, you know, like going my way and those kind of kind of. I think movies. it was going my way that oh, it was forty four yeah. that probably, but yeah, it was going my way. I think, and so it was the New York Film Critics Circle Awards. So Stanwick and Billy Wilder, Wilder were nominated for their for their roles, but they didn't win. I think the only one, um, uh, basically a two thousand a post human humanist um, uh, online film and television uh, association award in oh. two thousand seven for the motion picture. But oh, like the thing is, Double yeah. Indemnity is is far more talked about far more talked about yeah than going my way yeah but isn't that true though i i think sometimes the oscars should be given only 10 years after like there's the oscars should be about 10 years behind you know so that we the see release date <laughs> yeah what what movie did we end up talking about i mean when we have a party are we watching shakespeare in love or are we watching the matrix which one had longer impact you know and and you look at you look at a film in retrospect because when it's fresh like that it's great to say oh yeah this is it or or a film where you're like wow that one but then you know five years later you realize the true impact was this other film, you know, yeah. it was, was this, this film that has, you know, stood the test of time. Um, thank you to uh, Troy. I'm glad uh, you enjoyed listening to us talk about this. Uh, Script and I love talking about story and uh, we're hoping to create some new ones ourselves uh, together. We're in business together to make movies. Uh, Tree Rock, thank you so much. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, there is no romance in movies anymore. And we hope uh, to bring that back. And uh, KR Nut, I'm glad you had fun. I'm, I'm glad everybody stopped in. Uh, Script, I want to thank you. Thank you, first off, for your friendship, but second of all, for being so uh, well-spoken uh, uh, about some of the films that, that I love as well. Um, if, if you'd like, let's do this again real soon. Yeah, let's, uh, let's you know, leave a comment um, on the video of what, uh, what movie you want us to take a look at next time, and we'll, we'll see if we can find it, if we don't have it, and, and discuss it. <laughs> But, absolutely um, yeah this is this is great because i love talking with uh, you just in general because it's so hard to find other filmmakers that do love the cl the classic classics as mm -hmm. opposed to the more contemporary classics like prior to the 60s <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm always surprised that most people don't know anything that didn't happen 10 years you know the 10 years before it's like oh no that was before i was born i'm like and <laughs> Yeah. No, yeah. maybe that was a re maybe that was a thing that was made that resulted in your conception. Like you got to appreciate it. <laughs> exactly, and uh, yeah, you know, Mozart did pretty well before you were born. So yeah, um, so yeah, I, where can they find you, Script? Where's the best place to get in touch? Uh, on Twitter at Script Doctor PhD. Um, I also have a YouTube channel where I do breakdowns and analysis of uh, film and television shows, which is uh, YouTube.com/slash Script Doctor. And uh, yeah, you can find some of my stuff here. And if you're new to this channel, which is uh, The Real Deal with Tom Conkle, please uh, hit that like and subscribe because he's got some cool radio plays, some funny short skits and sketches. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll really, really like, re like the content here uh, as you peruse it. Thank you. And you, you can even find uh, the movie here if you want to if you want to watch it. It's on here. So um, this is it for now. Um, we will look at uh, another film real soon. And thank you for listening. Take care, all.